Okay, fine, but I gotta tell you, I like a guy who plays hard to get. <laughs> what a man. Roxy Rocket, a character who Batman TAS co-creator Bruce Timm claimed featured in the riskiest episode they ever made. And a character I'm thrilled to talk about, because now I get to call this episode the Roxy Rocket Retrospective. Roxy Rocket comes from a time period where Paul Dini and Bruce Timm were trying to create more villains for Batman, specifically more female villains for the DCAU and thus the DC Animated Universe. This focus was particularly there because they'd had such success with Harley Quinn. However, unlike her, Roxy she never quite got off the ground, but she did still make that transfer over into DC Comics. However, she got in a way that was a tad self-indulgent. While created for Batman, there is another DC hero who she may have worked better with. A couple, actually, and we'll get to them. We're gonna take a look at Roxy and her evolution, and ultimately where she ended up, time of recording. I'm Sasha, and this is Casually Comics, and get ready for innuendo. So much innuendo, in her endo level of innuendo. Verbal, visual, auditory, we have so many choices. Roxy got a start in the DCAU, but on the comic side of things, debuting in the Batman Adventures Annual Number 1 in the year 1994. Created by Paul Dini and Bruce Timm, she is the focus of the framing device for the story in question, which is more of an anthology, and then there's a Joker story tacked on in the end. The tale she is bookending is called Going Straight. The story opens up with Batman chasing her. She's opening villain, and so she uses the big teaser splash page to exposit a little bit about herself. Here here I am, just a hardworking stunt girl trying to make a little extra cash. And you had to mess it all up. Well, happy landings, Ace. Batman is able to apprehend her quite quickly, and it cuts to her being paroled sometime later. As she leaves, she tells reporter she's gonna straighten up and fly right. Alfred is dubious. Picks her, it didn't happen. This sets Batman down a path reminiscing about his villains and various times they've attempted to reform and what it is that has set them back. These stories feature the ventriloquist, Harley Quinn and the Joker, and Scarecrow, who has arguably the darkest tale in the book, returning to teaching only to have one of his students who he develops a fondness for as a student, end up in an abusive relationship. So he decides to use fear as a tool against her abuser as punishment. It's very dark, and so it feels very abrupt when we transition back to Roxy. Roxy isn't the darkest of villains, let's put it that way. The return to her is so abrupt that it would have been easy to just end this tale without ever going back to her, just Batman turning off the computer. Compared to Batman's already established rogue, she didn't stand out too much, Rocketeer-inspired design and all. However, it appears that Roxy's up to her old tricks, robbing a cargo company. But Batman is able to see from the body language on screen that's not actually her, it's Catwoman, Selina Kyle. He knows that body. As they begin to engage in their usual game of chasing one another, or cat and mouse, or cat and bat, even though that gives me Tom King flashbacks, Roxy arrives in her giant rocket of obvious phallic symbolism. Roxy ends up not being a match for Catwoman and even appears afraid Catwoman is going to kill her. This is before she manages to knock her off and punch her off a building, freaking out about how she can't remember her name because Catwoman's been calling her other things, like a rookie. However, she didn't actually want to kill Catwoman, so she goes to try and help her up, but Catwoman scratches her hand and then plummets. She's laughing all the way down. Roxy's concerned, but Batman tells her not to worry, that she's got at least eight more lives. He's keeping track. Also, you can see from the panel that in terms of villain falls, this one is very small. It doesn't even warrant a question of whether they died or not. She's fine. Roxy says she came out because the cops were chasing her, because they assumed she was behind the robbery and she figured they wouldn't believe her. So she set out to catch the crook herself. So she's already kind of showing redemption style vibes or possibility. Because of this, Batman lets her go. He has other things to do, I guess. And she flirts with him and then he's gone. Okay, fine, but I gotta tell you, I like a guy who plays hard to get. <laughs> what a man. Though this is not where most will be familiar with her from, Roxy's first appearance already presents some of the issues that will prevent her from really taking off or catching on. Batman has an incredibly strong villain roster. It's already full of unique baddies. Most of the ones who have risen to the top present him with different challenges. Since the Golden Age, there have been some characters who have just broken out and others who just fade into the background. Some have come back and been retooled or found their footing in a different era, but there are plenty who have just been one and done or a couple of times and then just nothing else is done with them. They just don't have that it factor. Roxy doesn't come off strongly in that she doesn't really feel like a threat to Batman. He certainly doesn't treat her that way. Nothing she's doing is filling a void and already being filled by another Batman villain in the DCAU. Her motivation, which is one thing that sets her a bit apart, isn't gone into in her opening issue. But she still just fades, and having her fight Catwoman already highlights the similarities between her and some of his other villains. In her first outing, she's already repeating a dynamic, or attempting to. It would have been quite easy to have her fall into the and then we never saw her again category. However, Deanie really liked the character, stating, she's a character Bruce, Tim, and I created for the first Batman 
Batman Adventures Annual. We always liked her, so we created a television story for her. Sparks fly in that one. So Roxanne Sutton will be brought into the new Batman Adventures in the episode The Ultimate Thrill, which is where many Batman fans would have been first introduced to her. This outing would put her at the forefront and expand upon her character, sort of. The Ultimate Thrill was written by Hilary J. Bader and is billed as the first episode of the second season. It was established in the annual issue that Roxy is a jewel thief, and that is re-established here, as in her opening scene, she's robbing some rich people on a blimp. But we're 3,000 feet up. Isn't it cool? Bye. Roxy is quickly established as a thrill seeker, somebody who's out for an adrenaline rush, seeking riskier and riskier highs. The episode also wastes no time in pushing those censorship guidelines. Fast men, fast planes, it's almost heaven. Let's burn. You got the skills, you have got the guts, but you just don't have the tools. Thanks for a great first date. I'll call ya. Once one sees it, the amount of innuendos in this episode are distracting. Sexual undertones everywhere. From Roxy to Batgirl's informants. Those sex workers actually pop up later, again, in Batman Beyond Return of the Joker. The thing is, in this episode, these things are just happening cuz. I know he lives for the chase, and I was the best he ever had. It doesn't enhance or detract from the episode, but it also does nothing to really inform the happenings, and it doesn't need to be there. It's just kind of there. Everything that happens could not happen, and the episode would stay pretty much the same, although it may be slightly less memorable. I love a man with staying power. There's even an appearance from Bruce Tim's favorite ship, and seemingly no one else's. Or she's still after the thrill, and now that she's had a taste of you, she's not gonna settle for anything less. Stop it. Get some help. Roxy is stealing and fencing the items through the Penguin, who has pretended to go legit as a businessman with the Iceberg Lounge. Despite having the skills to fly under the radar, she can't stop baiting Batman. Her history is explained as she was a stunt woman who pushed the boundaries to the point where she became uninsurable, and she'd been seeking new highs and living dangerously ever since. The whole being in the movies aspect doesn't really factor into her character, only the stunt woman aspect, which is a bit odd for a Batman villain. They flirt with the concept a couple of times, but they don't go all in. I want you to tone it down. <laughs> and what? Spoil the fun? This isn't a movie, you know. I'm a legitimate businessman now. Batman's villains often play in the realm of mental illness or instability. It's one of the ways in which they stand out. Had Roxy thought that life was a movie or she was still acting or something along those lines, it would have aligned her more with the rest of Batman's rogues. Her practicality puts her more in line with a Flash villain. She feels like she would fit in well with his rogues. She'd have a good time with them. Similarly, her thrill-seeking while dangerous doesn't reach points where she's actually actively out of control. She's endangering others a little, but even in those scenarios, she tries to stick within some boundaries where she still has the advantage they're not wild nobody gives me trouble this will all be quick and painless this occurs even at the episode's climax in more ways than one. Oh, baby you're the best the ultimate thrill the final stunt me and you yeah yeah I hear you episode, don't think I don't. I see what you're doing, they're both on a ride on this giant penile rocket. In this final moment, it's Batman who pushes her over the edge. Initially when she sees he's not backing down from the game of chicken, she goes to stop it. So the idea of her behavior escalating to a point where she's lost control isn't really explored. She ends up just becoming another villain who has lahats for Batman, which is not exactly new territory for him. No wonder he looks so bored and stoic. He's just like, man, again? It's a fine episode, but not one that demands the character get more exploration. She would briefly find her Herself encountering and flirting with Superman in one of his episodes, Nighttime. It's a crossover episode with the Batman series. What's a buddy? It'll hurt you a lot more than me. I'll risk it. Aw, I'll be your friend. Sorry, little girl. You're going home. But after that, she pretty much vanishes from the DCAU. Until Batman The Adventures continue in 2020, and then just in limited cameos and issues written by her co-creator, Paul Dini, who is also the one responsible for bringing her into the DC Comics universe proper. Paul Dini had a stint writing Detective Comics, and in 2006, in issue 822, he brought in Roxy Rocket. It was a small role, and once more, she's the opening villain. She's gone within a couple of panels. She's stealing a new ion thruster for her rocket from Star Labs, and Batman easily stops her. Once more, his dominant feeling is inconvenienced. It took me 60 seconds to steer Roxy's retro rocket into a tower of the Sprang River Bridge. It took me another hour and a half to get us both down from there, as if I don't get enough grief from flakes like Harley Quinn. Ugh, Batman's sassy today. It's nothing much. Then the story moves on to the reformed Riddler arc, where he was a glory-seeking private detective. 
Good times. I really liked that arc. This was an instance of a creator adding in a character that they were fond of. Just a small, brief appearance. It's a little self-indulgent, but not in a harmful, over-the-top kind of way. It's not as if she's brought in an entire arc, it's constructed around her, and the entire story has to stop and look at Roxy. There's no attempts to force her into anything, it's just a brief nod that fans of the DCAU may appreciate. Or perhaps if there was interest in her in this new setting, something could be done. There was not interest. <laughs> her next appearance as pre-New 52 relaunch would be in the Stephanie Brown Batgirl series under the helm of Brian Q. Miller, who seemed to have a fondness for the DCAU verse. You can see that because a couple of characters from there make appearances in his run. Livewire also appears here and fights Batgirl. Roxy first appears in issue 6, where she's described as every insurance company's nightmare and every wild man's fantasy. Really? Every and only wild men? Why are we limiting Roxy like this? I think there are plenty of people who are down for that Rocketeer look. Or I guess the Ace Fighter pilot look. Here Roxy's part of a gang of villains assembled by Roulette to take down Batgirl man who was Dick Grayson at the time. Because Bruce was dead. Just like time of recording, he's about to be dead again. Roxy even gets to be on the cover of issue 7 fighting Batgirl. Mind if I cut in? Sorry, sweetness. This rocket is built for one. That's a lie and we all know it. She's again easily dispatched when Robin, Damien, throws Dr. Phosphorus in the path of her rocket. And that's all she wrote in that timeline, unless one counts the cover of Batgirl issue 24, which she's on. So, for this part of her history, she's utilized very much as a fill-in villain. Someone to round out the number with a slight gimmick that makes them a little bit dangerous, so a low-level threat, something that you're gonna have to pause and take some time to deal with, but not too much. Not once does her personality or motivation end up mattering in these appearances. So how does she fare in the New 52? In this universe, she's introduced in 2013, in Batman Black and White number 1, in the story called Driven, written by John Arcudi with art by Sean Murphy, who also came up with the concept, whose name I always feel like I'm saying incorrectly if I don't also say his middle name. I can feel the Gordon in my mind. In this, we're introduced to Roxy, not on a rocket, but in a kind kind of rocket-shaped car as she races Batman through the streets, seemingly royally messing up the Batmobile. After an intense drag race across Gotham, he's able to secure her. When he gets back to the Batcave, he finds out the Batmobile is fine. She's just that good. The entire time, it felt slightly off-putting to see Roxy in a car and not flying. Or based on her history with stunts, if it was still her history, then yeah, she should be able to do that. It was a cute little one-shot, but it could have been any villain. It doesn't really benefit from being Roxy. Once more, it's just a bit of a, oh hey, is that Roxy Rocket? For those who know of her. This story is also reprinted at the end of Future State Gotham issue number 10, for reasons. Then she appeared again in 2017 in Justice League Rebirth number 1. This issue by Steve Orlando. In this story, Batman is assembling a new league. He wants people who are mortals, who people can relate to, not gods, which is why he went and got Killer Frost and Lobo. Anyway, Roxy Rocket is taken down by Vixen, but not before the concept is introduced that she's of YouTube's favorite villain. Absolutely nothing happens with that, unfortunately. It's a throwaway line. Also, this kind of line isn't really in keeping with Roxy, who seems to have the same backstory as she's described in this issue as having been a former stunt woman. She already did the fame thing, and it wasn't enough. She had to expand beyond it to a whole new level of thrill seeking, a new frontier. However, the idea that she would have fans because of her film work is an interesting one. Would there be more people pulling for her to reform or even trying to get her more work? But again, it doesn't go anywhere because she's once more just a filler villain. And time of recording, that's where Roxy. Roxy sits in the comic verse, floating in a realm close to obscurity, trapped by an insistence seemingly coming from some corner that she must be tied to Batman and his mythos. Even though as evidenced by an adaptation, there could be more ways to think of her. Enter Justice League Action. Justice League Action was an animated DC series geared towards a younger audience, although again it had some nods older viewers could enjoy. This series ran from 2016 to 2018. Unlike say a Teen Titans Go, this was a purely superhero based show, even if it was lighthearted and at times silly. It didn't veer into satire. Kevin Conroy also reprised his role as Batman, as did Mark Hamill with his role of the Joker for this series. Roxy appeared in the 28th episode entitled The Fatal Fair. This episode was written by, wait for it, Paul Dini. He just loves Roxy and she's going wherever he is. Unlike prior Roxy outings, this one has nothing to do with Batman at all. Instead, this is a Space Cabbie episode. Space Cabbie is a character from the 1950s, and he is exactly what it says he is, a cabbie in space. This episode establishes that once her stunt woman career wasn't enough, Roxy took to space as an entrepreneur with a rival taxi business where she'll take on any fare and take you anywhere on her rocket. Space Cabbie, who is just called Space Cabbie, his name is a secret, he's a bit insecure about this because his cab is a bit… homely. <laughs> So, the seat's a little broken in. It's like flying the family couch. Oh! 
Note that he describes it as a couch. So later on when he picks up dark side, this is going to count as a dark side on a couch joke, as well as a dark side doing regular things joke. There's a running gag in this that people keep picking him up because they misread his name as Dark Seed. Now I'm just worried he's going to have to go and smite the whole galaxy to get some more cred. Dark side is not Dark Seed. After some shenanigans, now very sassy Clark. I can send you away, Dark Side. Space Cabby and his Star Wars reference droid end up with a broken down cab and having to call, you guessed it, Roxy's Rocket Service. But she needs to pick up another fare because he didn't pay extra for the premium solo ride. She needs to go pick up some kind of dark seed? Womp womp womp. This episode is pretty by the numbers. As soon as their rivalry is introduced, you know what the payoff is eventually going to be. However, this episode does introduce the concept that Roxy can potentially exist and maybe even thrive outside of and away from Batman. For after examining Roxy's history, both inside the DC you and outside of it, it appears that her and Batman are mismatched. There are many heroes who could stand to have their villain rosters boosted or expanded, particularly in the female villain sector. In general, there is a lack of decent female villains, or ones who don't seem to be given an inevitable redemption arc. Let some just be evil. I want to feel original Maleficent levels of evil, ruining people's lives because she wasn't invited to a birthday party. Just give me some Silver Age level pettiness. But when it comes to Roxy, who could one pair her with? Allow me to paint a picture for you. Take you on a journey and you can tell me if you like it or not and also take me on a journey of your own if you have a different idea green lantern specifically hal jordan let me explain in the episode the ultimate thrill it mentions the concept that roxy is fearless but it's indicated in both the episode and her first appearance in the annual that's not the case she's someone who can overcome fear and has become addicted to that rush the adrenaline that that gives her and she's seeking that type of high and needing more and more to fulfill it the green lantern concept is about overcoming fear through willpower and channeling that willpower into action, which through the rings become constructs. Roxy could function as a bit of a dark flip side to this idea. The concept that with no positive outlet for this kind of mindset or ability, it could turn dangerous. Or that it could just lead one down a less desirable path. One could keep her in the flirtatious thief realm or push her into something darker. Her rocketeer and flight theme would also work well with Hal specifically, since he is a pilot. Remember him for the planes he flew, never forget. You could keep her history the same or change it. Keeping it the same, but actually playing with the film aspect perhaps give her some acting skills so it's not always clear if she is or isn't afraid. How much of her is genuine? How much of her is playing Roxy? Roxy had ever been shown as being in favor of stealing aviation themed items so she could meet Hal robbing Ferris Air. Boom! Hal can also be quite a disaster so there's a bit more room to maneuver in their interactions. She could potentially get more out of him than the more stoic encounter she had with Batman and Superman in the DCAU. Even Batgirl doesn't riff with her too much. I couldn't imagine Jon Stewart putting up with any of her nonsense. <laughs> the only thing is Hal would probably take her up on that flirtation and sleep with her. Test drive that rocket. And that would still be one of his better and less problematic relationships. Unlike Star Sapphire though, this wouldn't have to be played as some doomed romance, but it could be more of a hookup type thing. Something more casual, enemies with benefits. Perhaps him just being drawn to how freely she can chase this feeling while he has to implement this rigid control. Which also works with Hal's character because it has been shown that he can snap. Oh, who am I kidding? Hal Jordan doesn't even know what Will is. Yes, one more time, go ahead in there. And no redemption arc for Roxy, please bad to the bow. You could also potentially make a compelling case for her and Jessica Cruz, because Jessica is someone who was constantly fighting to overcome her fear. Her fears and anxieties were at a point where sometimes they kept her fully in the house because of her agoraphobia. Going up against someone like Roxy, who has such a different experience with overcoming fear, could be a very uncomfortable thing for her. I just came up with that on the fly. Her and Jessica. Ponder it a bit more. I can see things coalescing. That would also be fun. Maybe she can just fight all the different Green Lanterns and she'll have different relationships with with them all. This idea, I like it. I like it a lot. Roxy has potential, just probably outside of Batman's purview. Or do you feel that she's a one-note villain with a decent design? Someone who was largely kept around by the love that was given to her by her creator. What would you do with her character, if anything? Tell me things down below. And while you're down there, please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking this time today spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.